Chapter 11 Three days after Enoch was released from prison in Munich, we crossed the German border. In spite of our fears that we might not be permitted to leave the country, no one seemed to care. The car was packed with our four children, our luggage, and of course Enoch's little dachshund. It was a wonderful feeling to be out of the fortress of death, to breathe once more the sweet air of freedom. The White House at Repse St. Georgi opened its hospitable arms to us, and dear Bishop Mikes welcomed us to his warm, sympathetic heart. We stayed there for two happy, peaceful months, in spite of the disquieting news of events. July 25, 1934, came the Nazi push in Austria. Chancellor Dreyfus was assassinated. In August, old President von Hindenburg died, and Hitler became the actual head of the German state, making himself president as well as chancellor. I tried to persuade Enoch never to go back to Germany again. But his heart was so deep in Gutenberg that he wished to risk his life rather than to live in exile. In the fall, our passports, made out in better times, expired. There were urgent business matters pertaining to the estates, which made it imperative for us to return to Germany. I was apprehensive over sending Philip Franz and Karl Theodor back to school in Austria, but Enoch insisted that for the time being it was the best place for them. We settled down to what we hoped against hope would be a quiet life in Gutenberg. Every day was clouded with the permanent danger which hung over Enoch. He was no longer a free man. For weeks, our mail would be held by the Gestapo, and we did not know where microphones might be hidden. Many things we never discussed, except when we were out in the forest or driving in a car. In spite of all of this, Enoch was glad that he had returned to Germany. In his heart, he was sure that a time would come when he would be able to take some action against the Nazis. The political inactivity, after so many years of feverish work, was very trying for Enoch. The Nazis eliminated him as a danger by a strict policy of isolation. It was all the more difficult for him because the anti-Nazi men were forming resistance groups. As Karl Ludwig's activities in this new group increased, Enoch's forced inactivity and isolation became more and more unbearable. I could see it in his face. Karl Ludwig and his political friends were often our guests, but even in the most general discussions there had to be great caution. A word overheard by the wrong person could mean death. We learned on irrefutable authority that the Nazis had never ceased to regret that they had not done away with Enoch when they had him in prison in 1934. He was permanently on the Gestapo blacklist. One false step would be an excuse to put him to death. He could not even see Karl Ludwig too often for fear he might endanger his brother. During the period from 1934 to 1937, our life was, because of these circumstances, uneventful. If it became too hot in Gutenberg during the summer months, we would go to Weisendorf, where the wide lawns and gardens were pleasant and refreshing. We could not go far away, for the surveillance of the Gestapo was unceasing. The net of Nazi domination in the life of the average individual was constantly being drawn closer. The influence of propaganda, which had reached the point of science under Goebbels, was unbelievable. It was soon impossible for anyone in Germany to evaluate events within Germany or news from the outside world. It would take a book in itself to list the monstrous lies which were fed to the German populace and, I regret to say, by and largely swallowed as truth. Any editor who deviated an inch from prescribed propaganda policy was quickly removed, often sentenced to life at hard labour. The same was true of the radio. Perhaps the most insidious aspect of radio propaganda was the power of the human voice over the printed word in swaying the emotions. 
there was the new culture with its attendant burning of all undesirable literature, the cruel and debasing anti-Semitic measures, and the endless propaganda, the strangling hold on education and on religion. There was not an aspect of life which was not controlled and regimented into the groove of the Nazi ideology. One began to see slogans painted on walls and buildings, all for the race. People were Aryan and cradle conscious. Hitler was assuming the guise of a god. He not only spoke to his people himself, he spoke through his ministers. The fact that a cloudless day was called Hitler weather may convey some idea of the extent to which this man had gained control of the minds of the people. The only good thing which we could find coming from the welter of directed confusion was the fine roads which were being built. The easy access over these super autobahnen had a tendency to unite the country as nothing else had been able to do, bringing many isolated regions into focus on a national scale. At Neustadt, on the Saal, Karl Ludwig published and was editor of a monthly paper, the Weisse Blatter. This was a fine periodical based on strong Christian principles. It was indicative of Karl Ludwig's fearless and determined character, as well as his diplomacy, that it could be published at all during the Nazi regime. Although much pressure was placed upon him, he firmly refused to publish any material which was even faintly pro-Nazi. Many well-known men of the resistance wrote articles for this paper, and it is now common knowledge that the board meetings of the Weisseblatter were used as a means of communication for the men high in the resistance movement. One article in particular which I heard discussed was written, about 1939, by Ulrich von Hathel, who had been ambassador to Italy and was a man of high political acumen. This article, while putting forth the ideas of Baron von Stein on the organic state, was in reality a very subtle way of making known the conviction that the survival of the existing political structure in Germany was impossible. Eventually, it would have to fall into a pattern of the organic state or perish. This article created a great stir and much discussion, for the thought behind it was provocative as well as courageous. Just before Hitler became Chancellor, my stepfather, Baron Gagan, had died. His death undoubtedly saved him from a tragic end, for he was a violent and outspoken enemy of Hitler. After his death, my mother continued to live on her small estate near Nuremberg, but she often came to visit us. It was also during this time that our faithful Wagner began to fail in health. His responsibilities were too much for him. He had always been very conscientious and exacting in every small detail, not satisfied with anything short of perfection. He retired to live with relatives in a small town well provided for with a pension from us as well as the customary government pension. He often came to visit us. I think that he worried about the ability of his successor. He felt that no one would assume the proper sense of duty in the house. That was correct. No one could ever take Wagner's place either in the house or in our hearts. The man who replaced him was very grand and came well recommended but we always doubted his political trustworthiness. We particularly worried about the danger of arrest for listening to the broadcast from England. It was a risk which we were willing to take, for it was a link with the outside world, like a warm and comforting hand clasp across the miles. On one rare occasion in 1936, we left Gutenberg. A foreign diplomat invited us to attend a Reich party tag, one of the tremendous annual gatherings in Nuremberg. I did not wish to go, but Enoch insisted. You must come, Elizabeth. After all, this is making history and we have to face it. So we joined the thousands who choked the highways. All roads seemed to lead to the huge Nuremberg party Ginlande. Even the Nazi buildings were counterfeit. There were hundreds of small white pillars which carried no weight. At intervals all around the amphitheatre, the brilliant red flags with their crooked cross 
played in the wind against a cloudless blue sky. The evil emblem of the swastika was everywhere. Our seats, among those reserved for the diplomatic corps, were near the speaker's platform, where we had an excellent view of everything. Thousands and thousands of brown-clad SA men arrived in columns. The discipline was wonderful. The carry, exact to the inch. Next came the black columns of the SS, all of them physically magnificent, but with empty faces, faces frantically stern. Following the SS came the grey columns of the army, where they were still to be seen, good, trusting faces, then unaware of the infamous plans which they were to serve. In the centre of a group of powerful cars, the Führer arrived, standing with his right arm raised. A roar from the masses rose to the ear-splitting crescendo of a mighty heil. Quite near to us, Hitler left his car and climbed the steps to the platform. This was the first time that I had seen the Führer. Was this the giant? Was this the genius? I watched him intently. This man was ordinary in appearance, with a commonplace face and obvious gestures. Where was the fire, the power which he was set to exhale with his every breath? For me, the man gave the impression of emptiness, of negation. Then he began to speak. His face underwent a change. There, before my eyes, I saw a frightening transformation. His entire appearance altered. It was as if some magic had touched him. It was the same old rubbish and lies, but now told with an unbelievable hypnotic power. The crowd roared, they shouted, they stamped. There was no doubt that there was something diabolically impelling in that voice. The speech ended, and the Hurst Wessel lead, that awful song, was followed by the once-loved national anthem, Deutschland über Alice. The same vacant-looking average person descended from the platform and was driven away. I was convinced that the man who had spoken was possessed. It was not his own power, nor his fire, which had hypnotised the people. This was without a doubt the power of evil. Soon after the spectacle in Nuremberg, Enak, as a reserve officer, was called to a term of duty in the Navy. Enak loved the sea. His mother felt that he inherited this love from one of her ancestors, who was an English admiral. When Enak, as a very young man, joined the Navy, instead of the Bamberg cavalry, it broke a long-established tradition of the Franconian nobility. His naval career did not last long, for in the first battle of World War I, Enak's elder brother, Maximilian, was killed, and Enak inherited the estates. He asked to be relieved of duty, and when this request was granted, he was placed in the naval reserve. After that, his only contact with the navy had been the required annual tour of duty. He always looked forward to these short periods of service with enthusiasm. But this time, I was worried. You know, Enak, that all reserve officers must now swear their personal oath to the Führer. What are you going to do? I asked. I have been thinking about that. I won't do it. I'll tell them I can't. They will have to find some way out for me, or... I know, I replied, and my voice almost failed me. Prison again. When Enak reached the naval school, he went to the commanding officer and told him that he would never take the oath of personal loyalty to the Führer. There was a way out. Just what it was, Enak would never tell me. In 1937, we moved for a time to our home in Würzburg. We did this particularly so that we could have our boys with us during the last two years of their studies. The old home of the Gutenberg family was in the Herrengasse, close to the cathedral. It had been a canonical palace, built in the early Renaissance and redecorated in the style of Louis XVI. It was, in many respects, a small echo of the mighty symphony which had been created in the Episcopal Palace at the other end of the block. It was a gem of a house, with its wide white rooms, priceless boiserie and Louis XVI furnishings. The delicate plasterwork was further enhanced 
by the addition of landscapes and laughing cherubs. It was all in great contrast to the far older and more sombre key of Gutenberg Castle. To me, it was always a lifting of the spirit to stay for a time in the light and classical beauty of our Würzburg house. It was a rare privilege to be so close to the ducal palace or residence as it was called. This was considered the most beautiful of all German palaces. It was Baroque and Rococo at their best. Nothing had been spared in time or expense to achieve its perfection. It was a thing of complete beauty. The heart of it was the garden hall, around which were spread more than 200 rooms. From the hall rose the magnificent staircase of Lorenzo von Bibra, its heavy Corinthian columns crowned with Tie Polo's frescoes. The state apartments were each an exquisite individual group. Many of them were ornamented with delicate stucco work, which was the creation of that great artist, Bossi. There were choice gobelins, priceless paintings and bronzes. Most remembered by everyone is the Cabinet of Mirrors, and beyond it, the regal room of state, where again there were frescoes by Tiepolo. Each field of art was represented by the very best of its master. Johann Peter Wagner created many of the fine statues in the park, and the delicately beautiful wrought iron work was by Ock. The palace itself was the dream of the Prince Bishop Julius, Duke of Franconia, under whose direction the original plan was laid out. To understand the strange and sudden blossoming of Rococo art, one must know something of the history of Bavaria. All Germany passed through a long and devastating period of war, which reached a climax from 1618 to 1648, and had a paralyzing influence on creative art of all kinds. Cities lay in ruins, churches, monasteries and castles alike were burned and sacked. Many of them were nothing but piles of blackened rubble. The sole interest of the people, both in the cities and out in the countryside, was in food and a place to lay their heads at night. Art was forgotten and beauty had been outranked by her sister, necessity. Bavaria, as the leading Catholic country, was subjected to greater systematic destruction than the rest of Germany. Even the spiritual level of the people receded on the ebb tide of war. When at last Germany thought of beauty and art, she turned to France for inspiration. The influence of the style of Louis XIV began to be felt in both the art and architecture of the country. People in Bavaria took up the task of rebuilding ruined castles and churches. There was a great surge of activity. It was undoubtedly the fanciful splendour of the Baroque which caught the imagination of the German soul, starved through thirty years of dark reality. A country so hungry for beauty could not be forgiven the later excess of the light and frivolous Rococo. Even the solid Romanesque and Gothic buildings, which had survived, were garnished with a frosting of gilt and stucco ornamentation. Germany reveled in the splendid, extravagant, luxurious Rococo. It was an era of powdered wigs and lace fans, fine damasks and gilt furniture, all reflected in tons of mirror and luster. This was the Rococo of Würzburg. There were two outstanding seasons during our residence in Würzburg. The first was our Christmas celebration. We had never before been away from Gutenberg on Christmas, which for us was always a day of great joy and tradition. This time the candlelit tree was in the wide white hall, and we were all happily united in our moving Christmas Eve celebration. Enoch decorated the tree while the children and I sang with thankful hearts the well-loved Christmas carols. The centre of our love was the image of the infant saviour under the glowing spruce tree. The climax was solemn, high midnight mass in the nearby cathedral. The other outstanding season was the June Mozart Festival in the Ducal Residence. The concerts were held there at sunset, and the one who chose that hour knew that with the golden rays of the setting sun, the palace was at its beautiful best. 
The wide princely rooms were lighted for these festivals with thousands of candles, and the air resounded with Mozart's inspiring music. After these concerts, Enoch and I, in a mood of thoughtful joy, would walk hand in hand through the evening twilight. We loved Wurzburg. It was a strange but pleasing meeting of Romanesque, Gothic and Baroque. There was always an atmosphere of light-hearted joy in Wurzburg and an underlying current of deep and abiding spirituality. We were sad when our residence in Wurzburg came to an end because in the spring of 1939, the boys, having completed their education, were compelled to enter the army and they joined the Bamberg Cavalry. Soon after our return to Gutenberg, we were seated in the Hall of Arms with an English friend, discussing the growing political tension and the possibility of war. Italy had seized Albania. The Reichstag had laughed when Hitler read them a letter from President Roosevelt asking Hitler and Mussolini to guarantee the independence of the nations of Europe and the Middle East in particular. Hitler had ignored this and soon announced the withdrawal of Germany from the Polish-German non-aggression pact. Germany and Italy signed a military alliance. Enoch told our visitor that he felt sure that Germany was heading for a full-scale war and that he dreaded the possibility of having to take any part in it. But, my dear Baron, our English friend exclaimed in surprise, Certainly you and your sons would not have to fight if there is a war. Considering your political attitude, it would be just too fantastic. If it really comes to war, Enoch replied, if this maniac Hitler sets the world on fire, we shall be forced to fight, regardless of our political convictions. Any attempt on our part to evade military service would mean immediate death. Perhaps that would please the Nazis, Give them the excuse for which they have been waiting. Now there is talk that Poland will be next. They discuss the Anschluss and the movement of Hitler's troops into Austria. This was a rank violation of the agreement signed in 1936 by which Germany recognized the sovereignty of Austria and promised not to interfere in Austrian affairs. Then came a discussion of the fallacy of the Munich Pact. For the men of the resistance, this pact was a bitter disappointment as they had planned to use Hitler's aggression in Czechoslovakia as a signal for revolt. Our English friend and Enoch then spoke of the annexation of the Sudetenland followed by the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. France and England and the United States had already protested that they did not recognize this protectorate. The next move would undoubtedly be Poland. On that, Enoch and our guest agreed. Then Enoch asked what the attitude of England would be in such an event as the invasion of Poland. The discussion went on and on far into the night. I listened without comment, as I had learned to listen through many years. I did not feel, as our guest felt, that total war would still be avoided by arbitration. I already sensed the coming disaster. When in July Enoch was suddenly called on Navy duty to the Isle of Silt, I knew that it meant war. He had to take the train for Bremen from Wurzburg, so we drove there together. On the road we scarcely spoke. We were trying hard to pretend to each other that this was just another of the short partings and frequent farewells which had filled our lives. But we both knew in our hearts, when the train left the Wurzburg station, that Enoch was going to war. I realized that if war was imminent, it would mean that Philip France and Karl Theodor would soon be gone. Since my mother was in Gutenberg with the girls, I decided suddenly to spend a few weeks in Bamberg to be near the boys. I stayed at a small hotel in Bamberg, and the first time that I saw my sons was when they came through the door into the lobby. While I did not like to think of them as soldiers, my heart leaped at the sight of them in uniform, so tall and so handsome. They both had Enoch's proud way of holding their heads. I thought of the first time I had seen Enoch in a uniform, a very strange one on that May morning after the siege of Munich. I could not allow my heart to dwell on the thought that these boys, 
our pride and our hope might soon be going to war to risk their young lives for a ghastly lie. In their regiment was Elizabeth and Clement's son, Carl Berthold. In fact, the regiment was filled with the sons of friends and of families who were bound to us by ties of blood. I was still in Bamberg on the first day of September when Poland was invaded. On September the 3rd, England and France declared war on Germany. I felt as if the whole world was suddenly on fire and the fiends of hell were shouting, Victory! It was four o'clock in the morning, not yet light. The troop train was standing on the track of the Bamberg station. The cars were filled with the flower of Bavaria's youth, laughing, smiling, little realising the horror and suffering which lay ahead. I thought of the trains crowded with young men, which I had seen on the trip back from Hungary in 1914. Now I was there to bid goodbye to my own sons. Don't be too sad, Mama, Philip Franz tried to cheer me. From an earthly point of view, we don't know what we can fight for, but in our hearts we shall always fight for God, a sacrifice offered to God. How like Philip Franz to find some spiritual consolation for me at this trying moment. Goodbye, Mama, Karl Theodore called. Try not to worry. God be with you, boys, was all that I could say, choked with tears which I dared not shed. God bless you, my loved ones. The train moved slowly from the station, as if reluctant to carry all that youth to war, many of them to their death. At that moment I felt as if a part of my heart had been torn from me. One by one, other weeping mothers moved slowly from the platform. When I reached Gutenberg that day, there was a letter from Enoch. He had found a way of getting letters to me and avoiding the prying censorship of the Gestapo. This was the first letter I had received from him since he had reached the Isle of Silt. Darling, I can't tell you in what a state of mind I am. I can hardly face it. The most terrible crime since history began has been committed by losing this war on Europe. It has been committed by Germany, darling, and the boys and I must fight on the wrong side in this hideous battle. Dear, dear courageous heart, how would he be able to find his way through this awful tragedy? There were more letters, some of them with a hint of despair. Darling, you know that all my life is dedicated to fighting, but always fighting the evil. The ones we have to fight now are on the side of the good. Worst of all, it is not only I who have to fight, but I must lead my good men, perhaps to death, and I really can't find a way out. After months, he wrote again. Now, at last, I have managed to quiet myself. I have trained myself to do the simple duty of the hour and forbid reason to ask questions. One thing is simple and true. Every sacrifice counts in the sight of God. All three of my men were fighting with that conviction in their hearts. They offered the sacrifice to God, placing the serious moral problem in his hands, incapable of solving it themselves. How many Germans are passing through the same spiritual ordeal in fighting against their own convictions? It is the greatest tragedy for Germany and for the world.